Amen. Now, let's do it for God, not for any foe. Let us do it for God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I just crave your indulgence for one second to please rise up on your feet. And um, first and foremost, sir, Pastor Eugene, Pastor Laura, I love you guys. I'm emotional now. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. It means so much to me. For allowing us to use our potential to be what God wants us to be. Amen. Thank you, sir, for believing in us. We appreciate you. And I appreciate my beautiful wife. I love you. Thank you for being the best partner in the world. We're going to do something different. The Holy Spirit told me this while I was preparing on Thursday. Struggled with these actually, but he said we should do a three minutes time of worship. And what we're going to do, we're going to worship God. And this is what's going to happen. We're calling his names. And whatever those names mean to you is going to answer for you. If you need God to provide for you, he's Jehovah Jireh. If you need God to heal your body, he's Jehovah Rapha. If you need him to just be God, he's Jehovah Elohim. So we're going to worship Yahweh, Rapha, Elohim, Shaddai. He's going to manifest here. See, there is nothing, I'm a witness to it, nothing is impossible for God. I don't care what the doctor said. Listen, there's a name. His name is Jesus. That, that name, Jesus, every sickness, cancer, diabetes, stroke, whatever it is, sir, bows to it. Are you ready? Release yourself. Forget about your problems. Lift up your hands and just worship this King of Kings. Hallelujah. Thank you, sweet Jesus. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Your power is tangible here. This is an atmosphere where anything can happen. Once you plug your faith, listen, every day is God's day. The day you believe is your day. Did you get that? Every day is God's day. The day you step into faith is your day. This morning, I want you to step into faith because anything. Listen, Holy Spirit, thank you. I'll give you this testimony, then we'll sit down. A young man back in Nigeria got shot in 2007. They had to put an, um, a, an iron, whatever it is, an implant, a steel implant in his elbow. And he carried it for years. This man, one Saturday morning, went out to preach the gospel. Jesus love you. Jesus love you. Jesus love you. Went back to prepare for service for Sunday. He heard Jesus say, go to sleep. I want to do an operation on you. Listen, I'm not telling you what they said. I saw this implant myself with my two eyes. He woke up after a few hours. The still implant by his bedside. No, no surgery. Nothing gone. That is the power of God inside you, sir. Is that same power that is here right now? No surgery. Nothing. I saw that implant with my two eyes. I have seen God. Is that same God that is in you, sir? Is that same God that is in you, ma? Ah. All right. Let me preach. Thank you, Jesus. Father in Shabada. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Your glory is here. The impossible is happening already. Hallelujah. In case, in case you get your healing where you are, scream. Don't worry. This is, this is, it's, it's, this is a, in his presence there's liberty. It's, let us know. In case something happens to your body, let us know. Distract us. No problem. Because his power is here to heal and to deliver. Are you ready? Father, Lord in heaven, you said we should do this. And we know you are here. Do what only you can do. And only you will get the glory. Not me, not Pastor Eugene, no man. But only you, Jesus, will get the glory. Speak to our hearts. Let faith come alive. As the word comes forth, let it enter our spirit, man. And let it come alive. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Have your seats. Put your hands together for Jesus and have your seats. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. You want me to read my bio? <laughs> I'm seeing my bio up there. Okay. Any four serves on the tech team? Okay, it is gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. We've been studying the book of Matthew for some time, from the beginning of the year, actually. Amazing. You know what I love about this church? We believe this word. You know, everything talks about on this altar is backed up by this. Not just somebody's big idea, but what God's word is. So we've started in the book of Matthew. And last week, oh, powerful sermon. Jesus went about doing good. Doing what he knows how to do best. Healing the sick. Three major miracles we talked about last week. And here he is. He's tired. Let's read Matthew 8, 23 to 27. That's our text. It says, They all got into a boat and began to cross over to the other side of the lake. And Jesus exhausted, fell asleep. Suddenly a violent storm developed with waves so high the boat was about to be swamped. Yet, Jesus continued to sleep. Can you say what it is? Go back to that verse. I want everybody to see that word. Go back. Yet, Jesus continued to sleep what? <laughs> the disciples woke him up saying, Save us, Lord, we are about to die. But Jesus reprimanded them. What? Jesus, are you, are you serious right now? We're about to die. He said, why are you so gripped with fear? 
Where is what? Then he stood and rebuked the son, saying, Be still. And five days later, six days later, and instantly it became kind of calm, somewhat calm, perfectly calm. The disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another, see, uh, these disciples, sometimes I feel, I get angry with them. But then I realized that I act like the disciples sometimes. For crying out loud, I was just with this man that healed the leper. I was just with this man that did some crazy stuff. And not up to, I mean the same instant we entered the boat. And I'm like, oh, wow. Even the waves obey him. Does it remind you of yourself? Does that remind you of yourself? The storms of life come. Jesus just healed your body last week. And all of a sudden, something happens to your kid. And you go, oh, oh God, oh God. You forget that he's the same God that, just like the Israelites, <laughs> the same God that parted the Red Sea, Just a few days ago, you are coming to say, oh, we miss onions and garlic. Oh, Jesus. We want to go back because there's no onions and garlic. God help us. My question is, yet, or my, my emphasis is, yet, Jesus continued to sleep soundly. Track with me. How could he be sleeping in the midst of such a terrible storm? Was it because he was the Messiah? Was it because he was God's son? Didn't he care that they were going to die? Now, remember that a number of disciples were fishermen. So when somebody, just like me, I'm a pilot, if I tell you the weather is bad, know that his weather is bad. Okay? Not what they tell If I'm in the plane and I tell you this is going to be bad, put on your seatbelt. It is going to be bad. Because I know what a storm is. So the disciples exactly knew what it was. So they knew they were going to die. If not something, if something, a miraculous stuff happens. If something miraculous doesn't happen, we are going to die. They were utterly afraid and believed that they were going to die. Hence, they woke Jesus up and cried for help. There's nothing wrong in crying for help. Listen. There's nothing wrong for shouting, Jesus, help me. However, there's a level you can get to. And that's a level I want to introduce you to. The level where you stand up and look at the storm and say, be still. Not calling Jesus, come and help me. You know why? Because that same Jesus is inside of you. Amen. When they woke Jesus up, you would think that he would panic. You know, funny enough, when I was doing this, the illustration that Jesus that I got was actually Pastor Eugene. Imagine Pastor Eugene preaching three services powerfully, went for beach baptism and gets home. All he wants to do is sleep. And Austin comes, Daddy, Daddy! First and foremost, imagine Pastor, Pastor Eugene, you know he loves golf. And he's playing the PGA. And he's about to take the last shot. And he disturbs that sleep right there. Daddy, daddy, daddy. He wakes up, startled. And guess what Austin says? There's a roach. <laughs> oh, Jesus. It will take everything in Pastor Eugene's power not to slap him. <laughs> That is how Jesus felt. That is exactly how Jesus felt. That you waking me because of this? He said he reprimanded them. He reprimanded them. He was angry at the disciples' lack of faith. We sometimes say, well, but we're just humans. Huh. 
they obviously didn't know who they had in the boat. They obviously didn't know who they were because of who they had in the boat. Hmm. Now, my big idea for today is living the supernatural life a life of signs and wonders. God wants us to be born again, beautiful. But what next? To just come to church every Sunday, go back, don't even read our Bible, if at all, even have a Bible. We just tick off the box religiously. As a believer, I want to ask you this question. Do you really know what you carry on your inside? Do you really know who you carry on your inside? My Bible tells me, greater is he that, that is in me. It's not a figment of imagination. It is real. Greater. The Bible says, Christ in me. The hope of glory. Do you know what that Christ means? The Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. The anointed one and his anointing is in me. Ah! Ooh. I feel like jumping. Hey! Tell me so. Sir. Woo! Excuse me. This is the same Jesus that spoke to a wind and a wave that my brother told me I never knew how high it was 20 feet the wave was up to 20 feet he spoke to it and instantly immediately that same Jesus the embodiment of heaven God Jesus the Holy Ghost is in me oh my I'm sorry sometimes people think I'm proud or I'm arrogant. I just know who I am. I just know who I am. I know who is on my inside. The devil has messed us up enough in the church. We are not supposed to suffer what the other people suffer. Sickness has taken so much on us. I get angry when I see sickness. I get angry when I see poverty because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for all these things to go. So why is it are we wasting what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary? It feels like everything Jesus did was just a mere Bible story. But I remember God told me one time in 2010, he said, and if a lot of you Christians will come to heaven and do like this, huh? You mean this thing was available to me on earth and I did not use it? When you get to heaven, you'll see what you have made, of, made up with. What is inside you? The stuff you got inside you. Ah, shamande. Okay. Uh, I hope your faith is rising up. I hope I'm able to, by the special grace of God, quicken that faith in you. So that the devil doesn't play rigmarole with you anymore. That's a confirmation right there. Amen. In the midst of the storm we go through, we always have two reactions as an option. It's either fear or faith. The disciples responded in fear because that is the natural reaction of the natural man. There's nothing wrong. They're natural. We are just human beings. But Jesus responded in faith because his natural reaction is of a supernatural man. When we recognize that when God made man, he said these words. He made him in his image and his likeness. Genesis 1.26. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness what does that mean a goat gives birth to a goat a lion gives birth to 
a lion. Jehovah God gives birth to what? Don't be scared to say it. He gives birth to God. The Bible in Psalms 82, I don't have it there. It says, for ye are gods. That is the Bible. It's not fallacy. It's only this. It's in here. I'm not saying heresy, please. I'm just waking you up to see what the devil is making you miss. The greatest enemy of the Christian is ignorance, not the devil. That's the truth. The Bible says, My people die because of what? The devil? My people perish because of the devil? My people perish because of lack of knowledge. You don't know what is available to you. That is why you are dying. No. When Adam fell, remember God will come down. Before Adam fell, he will come down and spend time with, with Adam. Fellowship with him. But when Adam fell, he lost his supernaturality. So what did God do? He set up a rescue plan via his son Jesus who became the second Adam to restore us back to what the initial plan was of our supernaturality. So when we take Jesus in and accept him as our Lord and Savior, <laughs> this is what it says. John 3 verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when you give your life to Jesus, that is why Jesus was telling the demons in the scripture in John chapter 3. He said, you have to be born again. And, and, and Nicodemus was trying to say, should I go back to my mother's womb? He said, no. When you accept me as your master, when you open the heart of your, your, the door of your heart to me, I step in and then all things, the old nature, the nature of sin is removed. The nature of God comes in. And guess what that makes you? Supernatural. Hmm. I wrote down here, I said, so as you become, as, so as a born again child of God, you are naturally supernatural. That's your nature. Just the way Jesus was. <sighs> oh, thank you, Jesus. The supernatural becomes your nature. Verse 26 says, Then he stood and rebuked the storm, saying, Be still, and instantly became perfectly calm. The natural always answers to the supernatural. That is why even the winds and the waves obeyed him. Nature. <laughs> the disciples were stunned that even the winds and the waves obeyed him. Jesus speaking to his disciples in Mark eleven twenty three. 23, I don't have that here. He said, if you say to this natural thing, the mountain, be thou removed and cast out into the sea and you don't have any doubt in your mind or in your heart it shall be done my God I see so this shows that the natural always I'm saying it again always not sometimes always submits to the supernatural man because the supernatural man walks by faith and not by sight or by feelings. I want you to get this. If I don't say another thing, get this. Jesus was sent as a prototype to the earth. 100% human to 
show us how to live the supernatural life. The reason Jesus came, 100% human. He was 100% God, 100% human. He came to show us what it meant when, when God created us in the beginning. He came as a second Adam. So now he came to restore us to what our supernatural nature is and to show us the road on how to go and how to leave this earth as a supernatural man. Therefore, as a child of God, we can live life on earth the way Jesus lived. A life full of signs and wonders. Let me shock you. Signs and wonders is not for believers. Jesus never healed the sick and said, wow, ooh, I just healed that boy. No. It was natural for him. He did not go dancing and said, I healed that guy. But yet Jesus said when he was going, he said, these are the signs that shall follow them that believe. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall eat poison and nothing will happen to them. Even the serpents will bite them and nothing will happen to them. That is who we are in Christ Jesus. Ah. Listen, when I was preparing for this, even me, I realized I'm living under par. I'm not living close to the potential that I have in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus, um, the Bible, Jesus said in John 14 verse 12, he said, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do. He did not stop there. Even greater miracles than these because I go to the Father. So what Jesus did was, I'm going, you guys represent me. Take over. I'm done. You take over. Everything you see Jesus do, including walking on water, you can do it. It's not blasphemy. Is that not what, okay, put that scripture back again. I want everybody to use their mouth to say it. Do you believe the Bible? Okay, let us read it together. One, two, go. I tell you this timeless truth, the person who follows me in faith, believe in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than these because I go to be with my... Says Jesus, not any for. You want to believe it? Good for you. You don't want to believe it? Okay. But I choose to believe it. I choose to believe it because I get so angry that it, I hate, see, this young man, I hate the devil so much. And everything that looks like him, I, it annoys me. I hate it with a passion. When I see people suffering, I, I, I say, oh, I wish you can get this. Especially believers. So the question now is, why am I not seeing living the supernatural? I'm born again. I've given my life to Jesus. Why am I not seeing signs and wonders? Why do I still react the way the disciples react when the storms of life come and rage at me? What do I need to do to live the supernatural life. Let's start from the beginning. Number one, you must be born again. Not being a churchgoer. Not being a churchgoer. You must submit to the leadership and the rulership of Yahweh. The Bible says in John 3 verse 3, he said, Jesus answered him, I assure you most solemnly I tell you that unless a person is born again and new from above, he cannot ever see, know, be acquainted with and experience the kingdom of God. Jesus answered him, I assure you most solemnly, 
I tell you that unless a person is born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. To start to walk in the supernatural, you must be born again. Accepting Jesus into your life wholeheartedly. A lot of us, especially in this generation, want to serve God in our own, on our own terms. This is the terms and condition to serve God. Anything outside of this, you are living a risk. You are living a risk. This word of God is timeless. There's no new generation truth. There's no new generation truth. There's no Gen Z truth. It's this Bible. Amen? When you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you are translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You become a citizen of the kingdom of God. Your sinful nature becomes dead. Your new nature, which is the supernatural nature, is born. That's why what we are going to do today, the beach baptism, is very important. It signifies dying with Christ to those old nature and arising and living like him. So if you, are not, if you are born again and you have not done water baptism, this is your next step. Number two, be conscious of your new identity in Christ. What the devil, his tactics, he's happy. Okay, no problem, you are born again. The next thing I'm going to do is to make you conscious of your sin and your past. So every time you want to do something for God, he reminds you of your past. And makes you look, oh, you're so dirty. You remember what you did last summer? You know what somebody said? When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. <laughs> when he tells you of your past, tell him I'm born again. I'm alive in Christ Jesus. And guess what, devil? You're going down. <laughs> and Jesus has won the victory for me. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Woo! Become conscious of who you are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Become conscious of your new identity in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, not some, not a few things, but all things, all things have become new. Ah, hey, hey. thank you, Jesus. Woo! What does this consciousness do for you? It restrains you from doing certain things. It restrains your lips from saying, saying certain things. It restrains your feet from going to certain places. That's what this consciousness does. I'm not glorifying sin. I will never glorify sin. But the devil likes to trap our minds. And we, every time we go, oh, I'm but a sinner, oh God. I'm not worthy, oh God. You know we are not worthy. Forgive me all my sins, both known and unknown sins. Come on. Somebody gave a, an illustration. I was listening to it some days back. He said, imagine you as a father, your child comes every single day. Daddy, I'm sorry for, this, for, for, for I'm, I'm annoying you today and I'm annoying you, maybe the one I don't know what I did, the one I... How would you feel if he does it for every single day? It's annoying. It is annoying. Jesus saved you once and for all. Thank you. Jesus saved you once and for all. So now let the past go and live in the newness of who you are now. Amen? Amen? Amen. Number three. Okay, before we go to number three, I want to say this. Jesus walked this earth. Now, this consciousness also helps you to walk in the authority that is given to you as a child of God. You will live knowing you carry what you carry on your inside. You know that the full Godhead is inside you. Jesus walks with this consciousness. That is why nothing could face Jesus. Not even 5,000 people, hungry people looking for food. He knew what to do every single time. Number three, I rushed through the rest because these are important points. I remember when I wanted to use this word the first time I spoke. Like, don't, don't use this word. But today I'm going to use it. Study God's 
word. Listen, how would you know what is available to you if you don't read this? How would you get cure of the sickness of ignorance if you don't use this? How would you know you are healed if you don't know that he paid the price? How would you know you are rich? Jesus became poor so that an evil, my name is there, check it, an evil can become rich. Check it out. Yes, it's right there. If you don't believe it, go check. Any full standard version. <laughs> For you to actually know the greater one inside of you and all that is available to you, you have to take time. Time. The devil has done a great job in making even believers B U S Y busy. Busy being under Satan's yoke. He has done a great job in making sure that you don't have time to study. So all we do, we are okay in the morning. Well, I have Bible on my phone. I'll just play it while I'm driving. Oh, that's okay. No, sir. It doesn't work that way. I just finished my master's. I could not do my master's like that. I had to sit down on my laptop and research. To become, I, I have a master's degree in aeronautics. I have to study. I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I have to study. Not on the go. Not on the go. Take time to study God's word. Number four. Spend time in prayer. Prayer is the life of a believer. One day, God told me last year, this is something personal. You don't have to do it. But he said, I want you to sacrifice time for me. Wake up every day, 5 a.m., and pray for one hour. I said, to say what? What am I saying for one hour? <laughs> what am I saying for one hour? <laughs> really? <laughs> By the time I ask of all my needs, 15 minutes is gone, if at all. <laughs> but listen, when you take the word of God, and you first start, Father, I give you praise. I worship your majesty for who you are, for what you've done for me. By the time you're done just worshiping, time is gone. And then you now go to start praying for other people's needs, not your needs. That was a secret God gave me. When I'm looking for something in my life, I pray for it for other people. Spend time in prayer. Spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. That's something that is not common. There's a lot of back and forth about it. But Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, where he said, these are the signs that shall follow them. They shall speak in other tongues. It's the word of God. You can argue with the word of God. That's on you. But spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. Number five, the one that the Western world hates the most. You need to fast. Fasting is not a suggestion. In fact, it was when I came to the United States that I heard for the first time what Daniel fast is. Back home, we don't know what Daniel fast is. Oh, Right from five years old, I started fasting. You fast till six o'clock. From six to six, if you, see, if you take water, <laughs> they will whoop you. It's far, you but yeah, okay, I understand. We're in America. You got to do it. I, I even think, I think pastors said the same thing. I think that Daniel fast is even harder because by the time you meal prep, you are so thinking, you are thinking of the healthy food you want to eat, you have, and it's more expensive. It's just the truth. As long as I don't eat for, let me not go there. <laughs> Fasting deprives the natural to enhance the supernatural. Fasting is not a suggestion, but an expectation as a believer. Jesus in Matthew 6, 16 said, when you fast, not if you fast. Matthew 17, verse 19 to 20, Jesus talking to the disciples. The disciples said, why couldn't we cast this demon out? A lot of people take that out of context that, oh, it's because this goeth by fasting and prayer. 
listen, fasting does not make the name of Jesus more powerful. Neither does it make, the, that make God's power stronger. Rather, it helps kill unbelief in your heart and increase our faith in the power of Jesus. Fasting weakens our flesh and its desires and elevates and strengthens our spirit. Fasting does not change God, but changes you and I. Number six, finally. I'm sorry I'm taking time. Speak faith filled words. God is a talking God. The whole earth you see was formed and is sustained by the words of his mouth. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, Faith empowers us to see. By faith we understand that the universe was created by what? God did not do. The scripture we read, he said, and Jesus stood and did what? And he spoke. God is a talking God. And therefore, since we are born of God and we have his nature, we are a talking being. When you walk in the supernatural, the truth of his word becomes your reality. When you walk in the supernatural, you'll be very careful with your words. The power of life and death is in tongue. Let's read this scripture together. Matthew 12, 34. I'll go through it quickly. I'm almost done. Let me tell you something. Matthew 12, verse 36, 37. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. This is Bible. Words can be your salvation. Words can be your damnation. The fact that you may be sick the fact may be that you are actually sick. But the truth is that by his stripes I have been made healed. The fact it may be that you're broke. But the truth is that he shall supply my needs according to the riches in glory. Listen, truth doesn't deny facts. But what it does is to elevate you to come from the fact to the truth and make the truth of God's word your reality. Amen. Amen. I say this. Forgive my grammar. This is not in dictionary. Don't speak situationally, but speak revelationally. Jesus stood up and spoke not about the situation. Oh, this wind, oh, this. No. He spoke with the revelation of who he was in God, knowing that I cannot die until I lay my life down. I cannot die in this. This is not how I'm supposed to die. Speak revelationally. And the only way you can know the revelation is this. It's non-negotiable. Finally, these disciples, when they started doing everything I spoke about, Peter and John, the last scripture is long, were going to the beautiful gate. They were at the beautiful gate. The Bible says they were going to prayer service at 3 o'clock. So the disciples now got on to praying. They got on to waiting on God. They got on speaking in tongues. They got on reading the word. And Peter and John saw the beggar. And the beggar looked at them saying, give us something. Give me something. And the guy said, Peter said to him, silver or gold I have none. But what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. This morning, I've come to announce to you that you have something on your inside. You have someone on your inside that is greater than anybody you can ever think. That is greater than any situation. That is greater than any circumstances. His name is Jesus. I want you to bow your heads down. When you walk this earth with the consciousness of your supernatural nature, 
Signs and wonders become your own nature. Say these words after me. I am supernaturally natural. Say it with some faith. I am supernaturally natural. And naturally supernatural. The question I want to ask this morning. Are you born again? Because that's where we start. Have you fully committed to the authority and the lordship of Jesus? Or are you just living life the way you please? I want you to answer this question in your heart. If the trumpet sounds this very minute, are you 100% sure you are going to heaven? Jesus is saying, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. If you decide to open, I will come in and dwell and dine with you like a friend. I'm asking this question and you want to be honest. The truth is, if you're not saved, you're not safe. A life without Christ is a life full of crises. If you want to be born again, if you want to give your life to Jesus this very minute, I ask you, please, forget the shame. Raise your hand up, please. If you want this same Jesus that I'm talking about to come into your life so that you can start to walk the supernatural walk, lift up your hands. If you want Jesus to do it boldly, don't be ashamed. Raise up your hand. He wants to save you. He wants you to live this life in the fullness of his power. Say this prayer after me. Thank you for that hand. Lift that hand lifted up. Father, I come to you and I open the door of my heart. I ask you to forgive me all my sins. Wash me clean by your blood of your son Jesus Christ. I accept him today as the Lord of my life. I submit to his lordship. I ask you, oh God, take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen.